Hello, Portland. For those of you who have no idea who I am, first of all, how dare you? <laughs> Second of all, I have pulled this headline from Wired Magazine to give you a clearer picture. This mortician thinks you should spend more time with corpses. <laughs> so now that we're all on the same page, I think it will sort of make more sense why I have decided to title this talk Follow Your Dreams or The Blessings and Curses of a Very Specific Advocacy. <laughs> now, to be honest, I don't consider my advocacy extremely specific. Like, we're all kind of aware that we're in these uh, decaying flesh bags that will eventually die, but that doesn't stop people from seeing my work and my advocacy as incredibly niche. So as I talk about this today, we'll start by talking about where this incredibly specific advocacy all started. The first publication that ever wrote about me was the Huffington Post in 2012, and the reporter actually interviewed my mother, and this is what she said. We came to find out that she had been interested in death for quite some time and that we had somehow missed the signs. <laughs> which is very, like, 1990s anti-marijuana commercial. Like, <laughs> she was eating all those potato chips, but I didn't see the signs. <laughs> and with all due respect to my mother, who is amazing and I love very much, uh, there were signs. <laughs> Starting way back in second grade, when I found this award, which I got a super-duper job to Caitlin Doty, for what? For a good witch story. <laughs> Wish I could find a copy of that. What I do have a copy of is my diary from third grade. Yes. And diary, diary is kind of an expansive term because it was a notebook, a Hello Kitty notebook, that's completely empty except for one single entry, <laughs> which is, dear diary, today is Halloween. <laughs> Finally it's come! should I say, Finley it's come. <laughs> We're working on the spelling. Still not a great speller. <laughs> Keep in mind that I grew up in Hawaii. <laughs> Born and raised my whole life. So that means that I was really trapped between two worlds. So here we have me in high school. I'm clearly like committing to the combat boots and leaning very moodily against a chain link fence. But I believe this was school spirit day. <laughs> so I'm also wearing Aloha print shorts and like a Hawaiian surf t-shirt. The keeping between two worlds continued. I would often, sorry again, mom, I would sneak out starting at age 16 or 17, to go to these goth and fetish clubs downtown, of which we had two, Flesh and The Dungeon. <laughs> and then I would sleep in my car and wake up the next morning to go to my weekend activity, which was, of course, my competitive outrigger canoe paddling team. Because <laughs> that's what you do in high school in Hawaii. I also went to an incredibly conservative Episcopalian all-girls school. The uniforms, chapel, the whole deal. And we had Christianity courses every year. And in 10th grade, we had to write a big final paper on a character from the Bible. And I, of course, chose Satan. <laughs> The Prince of Darkness and his role in the Christian Bible, on which I got an A+, because I researched the crap out of Satan. <laughs> I knew more about Satan than any Christian schoolgirl ever. <laughs> this carries on. In 12th grade, I am made editor of the school yearbook. <laughs> and I was so happy. I love, love, loved doing this job. And in the first of two who let her do this examples we have today, I was allowed to theme the entire yearbook around my, at that time, favorite goth punk band, AFI. 
Anyone? Some AFI fans in the house. Okay, great. This is the opening page that I photoshopped, which appears to be some of my classmates like writhing in the pain of hell and damnation. I pulled this out for this talk, and I don't like to look at it very often <laughs> because every time I do, it reminds me of that Ira Glass quote, for the first couple of years you're making stuff, what you're making is not very good. And like nowhere is this more profoundly true than this yearbook. So at last, I graduate and I go to college on the mainland. Like this is my big chance. I'm on the mainland now. And in a second of who let her do this examples, I was manager of the coffee shop at University of Chicago, the student-run coffee shop. And I was allowed to launch a school-wide renaming campaign of beloved Uncle Joe's coffee shop and choose the winner, which I deemed hallowed grounds. <laughs> which is the name to this day, because <laughs> you can't rename it all the time. And I argue is a good name for a coffee shop. To graduate in medieval history, of which I was, I was a medieval history major, to graduate, you need to do a thesis, a long research thesis. And my thesis was, in our image, the suppression of demonic birth accusations in late medieval witchcraft theory. Which means that many years later, I was awarded my thesis, my degree in medieval history for a good witch story. <laughs> and I ended up eventually, just a year or so ago, doing a video on it, which I called Demonic Babies, A Guide for New Parents. And just really quickly, because I know some of you are interested, okay, so there was a medieval theologian named Thomas Aquinas, and he proposed that you could have a human male, and then a female demon, a succubus, would have sex with the human male, and take his semen, and transmorgify into a male demon, or an incubus, and impregnate a human woman with that semen, and thus a demonically inspired baby could be born. That's neither here nor there, I just wanted to make sure we're all clear. <laughs> so this is all to say that by the time I was 23, I had graduated from college and living in the Bay Area, it was not a massive shock or surprise when I took a job at a crematory. And I was the crematory operator, which means I was the one who was actually there behind the scenes doing the cremation of the bodies. And it sounds sort of bizarre to say this, but within two weeks of doing this job, I knew that that is what I was going to do with my life. And I don't just mean working in the funeral industry, I mean doing exactly what I'm doing right now, translating what was going on behind the scenes in the funeral industry to the general public. Because I was seeing things every day that were blowing my mind. For example, this is a cremulator. How many of you know what a cremulator is? A cremulator, yeah, some cremulator fans in the audience. <laughs> what a cremulator is, is when you put a body in a cremation machine, the heat is so high that it takes all of the organic material away from the body, and what you're left with is big bone fragments that are inorganic material, so they're very brittle. So you take them over to this machine, the cremulator, and it's kind of a cross between a crock pot and a blender, and it whirs around for about 20 seconds, and that's where we get the ashes, the smooth smooth, sandy ashes or cremated remains that you've probably seen. So things like that, I was like, why don't people know this? <laughs> people need to know this. This is going to make them feel more empowered and more aware of their own mortality. And so, really, I started right then, and over the next 12 years, this is essentially what I have been doing with my life. And over that time, my advocacy has expanded to include green and natural options for death care, new technology, 
family-involved death care, encouraging people to, as the headline said, hang out with corpses and not be afraid, um, and low-income families and how to help them get better service around death care. We all, as advocates or activists or artists or whatever you in this room are, we have a lens through which we look at the world or understand the world, a paradigm. And mine just happens to you look like this. <laughs> I look at the world through death-colored glasses, you could say. And this is my boss, death, and I always have to be checking in and seeing if I'm doing the best thing for death awareness in our society. So, now that we know how we got here, briefly I'll talk about the things I've learned to be the blessings and curses of having this kind of very specific public advocacy. A pro is that there's no competition. <laughs> which works incredibly well for me. Because in this job, like being the world's most famous mortician is like being the world's most famous accountant. Like, it's just not a thing. Nobody else wants this job. There are incredible advocates who are doing work on the ground, but they don't necessarily want to do it publicly, which I completely understand. And for me, I'm not a very competitive person. I live in Los Angeles, where I see people fighting to get their screenplay made or to be, to be seen in some way, and that seems genuinely exhausting and genuinely very hard. I remember I was on the basketball team in high school, not because I was any good, but because I was tall and they made me. <laughs> and I didn't have any of that like eye of the tiger drive. I just wanted to trot off the court and keep running and read my book under the bleachers. That's like all I wanted to do. But with that lack of competition, the con is that that doesn't stop me from comparing myself to people all the time. Even though no one is doing what I am doing, it's very easy to like, you can still, your brain will still find something at which you are failing at. For example, I write books and I'm very proud of these books that I've written, but I have friends and colleagues who I consider real writers, like writers' writers. Whereas I'm just, you know, will my cat eat my eyeballs? <laughs> um, I also make videos. There are people who are making videos and web series now who are filmmakers, and we still edit on, I'm not kidding you, iMovie. That's how these get made. But I think the worst one is that I run a funeral home. I own a funeral home in Los Angeles, and there's this real narrative of, like, I'm a badass female entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas my actual lived reality is, like, LA city, you sellers permit, I don't understand. Like, it's just a nightmare of, like, small taxes that I have forgotten to pay. <laughs> And I'm like, what is this bill for $232? I have no idea what it's for or where it came from. Another pro is that it is easy to see value what I, in what I do pretty immediately, in the sense that cultural change around death is incredibly difficult because people don't want to face it or talk about it, right? But because I work with so many amazing people who are so smart and so willing to give their lives over to death, in this way, we've been able to make change. In Seattle, in Washington, they just legalized human composting, which is a radical, fascinating, eco-friendly new way to dispose of the dead body. And my close colleague, Katrina Spade, led that charge and created this method, and we really thought that it was gonna be years before it was legalized. And here we are, you know, year of our Lord 2019, and it is legal in Washington, and hopefully more places soon. In California, what I'm fighting for on the legal front is actually usually playing catch-up to what Oregon has already done, especially around death with dignity laws and alkaline hydrolysis or water cremation laws, which we both recently legalized in California as well. So it's a lot of being able to see, you know, real sort of legislative value in, in what you've been able to do. But <laughs> if you put yourself out there in any way, you're not someone who's an advocate, you're an attention-seeking harlot. And you'd be surprised, or maybe, you, no, you wouldn't be surprised, at <laughs> the men in my industry and the things they have to say about me. 
um, especially the more traditional funeral directors. Everything from she's a starlet, she's looking for her 15 minutes of fame. And I always want to tell them, if I was really looking for my 15 minutes of fame, funeral industry reform <laughs> is not what I would have gone with. I sure, surely I could, like, I consider myself a relatively intelligent person. I could have come up with something a little snappier than that. But it's especially hurtful, I think, when it comes from within your own community. This is a letter, an email that I got maybe five or six years ago when I was just starting to be a more public advocate. And this is what it said. You're doing in the USA more or less what I am doing in her country, but a much bigger, louder, more entertaining way. For me, too, it is a calling, and I love my work. But unlike you, I'm not great at attracting publicity and not naturally attention-seeking. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's a more like, charitable way to read this, which is that she's saying something nice, but I didn't see it that way, <laughs> especially when I was first starting out. And nowadays, I probably wouldn't have responded to this, but I did at the time, and this is what I said. I'm naturally an introvert, but at a certain point, what I believed and what I advocated for became more important than the desire for privacy and the fear of being judged. <laughs> Which I think is something that most activists or advocates go through. Not that everyone's an introvert, but the idea of, man, if I'm putting myself out there and I feel any pride at all in what I've done, does that mean I'm all in it for myself? That this is only for me just because I'm proud of what I do? And the answer is no, of course. Pro, <laughs> final pro, I do get to now, at this point, make money for doing something that I care incredibly deeply about. And I'm not advocating for that for everyone. I think it's equally valid to have a nine-to-five job and come home and be community engaged and have hobbies and have a rich life outside of your job. But for me, it's really nice to be able to do that. I was just in Moscow speaking at the Moscow Urban Forum, and then I got to spend the day with the bombed body of Vladimir Lenin, which is something that I have wanted to do, like talk about top of my bucket list. <laughs> that is what I wanted to do. One of the most iconic corpses of all time. And I got to just like go and visit him and then sit, which I highly, like TripAdvisor, five stars, major. Um, sit across Red Square and like eat my cherry blintz and drink my cappuccino and then go visit Lenin. It was like incredible that this was my job. And it was one of those moments when you're like, oh my God, I get to do this. But at the same time, when you work in a nonprofit like I do, or you, you start a nonprofit or you work as an advocate or an activist, you really have to excavate whether or not you have very negative money narratives that tell you that if you earn any money at all, a living wage at all, you are a bad person. Because I definitely had that. And it's only been recently that I'm like, wait a second, I can do more of this work if I'm not terrified about money <laughs> all the time. And so really figuring out what those narratives are that are running your life and running your financial life and saying, actually, we need to be paying our activists and our advocates a living wage. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to make this whole talk about money, <laughs> but they wouldn't let me. I was like, can I put up 401k data on there? And they're like, no, <laughs> fine. OK, I get it. Um, so I wanted to leave you with a final thought that was going to be incredibly profound and wrap this all up together. Um, but then my boss stepped in and told me that this is the first talk that I have ever done in my adult life where I have talked about primarily myself instead of what it is I do and what I'm trying to get across to you. So I'm just going to leave you with one piece. If you take nothing else from this talk, I need you to know that dead bodies aren't dangerous. And the reason that you should know that is because they are actually safer than living bodies, because living bodies are still sneezing and coughing and excreting, where dead bodies aren't doing that anymore. After a body is dead, most viruses and bacteria will die or diseases will die within several days, and you're totally legally empowered to hang out with a dead body. I just wanted to get that in. Thank you very much. Thank you.